talking about it even is not enough. You have to do something more. But I guess for me also, I, I feel very lucky um, to have kind of found, separate from all the other disciplines in theater, what I think of as my art. Um, playwriting is the medium of some, acting is the medium of others, but criticism is the place where my love of language just fits. And I feel that what I get out of it is very similar to what an artist gets from acting in a play or writing a play. Um, I actually didn't really want to be a theater critic, and I still think of myself more as a theater writer. So, um, I've always been a writer. It's my first love. And then I got involved in theater, and I became an actor. And then when that part of my life was over, and I put that behind me, I wanted to use my writing skills. And being a theater critic wasn't optional, all of the other kinds of theater writing that I do. And I was very hesitant about it because I felt like I was sort of going over in the dark. Side and I, I bought a really big purse so I could put my press packet in there and nobody would really notice that I was actually <laughs> now but, um, It was difficult to go into that, but um, I, um, I love writing and, um, it, and I love feeling and um, I feel like I know something about it, especially about acting, that's what I mostly know about. And writing, but so playwriting to a certain extent. And um, so my abilities also came together in this area. Well, it's interesting. So, you know, Rob became an actor originally, and also Judy was also an acting. Lily, it sounds like more acting, or? I tried everything else. You tried everything. <laughs> <too. laughs> and that's why you end up with critics like being your art. Because, you know, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, unlike, I was thinking before, but here at the panel, I was thinking that unlike with restaurant players, for example, you, you, know, you guys are not in hiding. You're not, at least one that I know of. <laughs> You're not in hiding anymore, anyway. <laughs> uh, people don't have, you know, they're not wearing wings to the theater or pretending or something. And as I said, the, the title for the panel was, to read 
I think, for its own sake, even if they have no intention of seeing a show. And entertaining can mean funny. It can mean probing. It can mean, it can mean informative and educational. So a, a good critic, um, we, we have one foot, I think, in that community, but we, we cannot be totally um, in it together with the playwrights. We must be able to step back and, and look and observe with um, a critical eye. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, I agree, and, and I'm going to add to that. This is a very small community, and um, some of us have been in, in, in That can be difficult, um, but I always recuse myself from reviewing a play where I have a good friend who's the playwright, the director, or an actor in it. Because I don't trust myself to be able to be courageous, like you say, and say what you want to think, or even to really know exactly what I think in those cases. Yeah, I think on one level, criticism is part of a conversation that we are having we do with the theater workers, with the playwrights, with the directors, with the actors, depending on what part of the production we come away with, we come away with feeling most um, compelled to address and also we feel is going to be of most interest to our readers or potential readers. Those, those people who look beyond the little man right, and actually read the, uh, the text. And, you know, like Jean, I came out of the local theater community. I've always loved it when I get some feedback, when I get feedback from, from the theater community. And I mean, I love it even when it's my opinion. Or, but also, you know, when people want, but particularly when people want to engage an idea that I've expressed or misexpressed or misunderstanding that I've had or what they perceive as you know, something that has sharpened their own um, perceptions of the piece. And I hear from a lot of people. <laughs> but, you know, way back when I first started having come out of the theater community, I, I loved hearing things like Okay, how did you know that? It's almost like you were a fly on the wall in the rehearsals, you know. And to me that's like, well, I know that because I worked with that director at such a point, I worked with that actor, and that actor would not have made those choices on his own. Or that actor would have made those choices if there hadn't been a director within 500 miles, you know. And you, you, you know, over the years of watching people in this, develop those kinds of senses of how certain actors work, how certain directors work, um, what certain designers are more prone to do or less prone to do, which designers design sets that you walk in and as soon as you see them you say, oh my god, I don't think you work on that set. And you could fall off that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, or you can throw your back out.
this was not intentional. I was highly distracted. And maybe just from where I was sitting, but I felt like I had to make that a point in my review because it's certainly a color my own experience of the show. And I thought it was good. You know, it probably would color many other people's experience. You can't watch. It's hard to watch actors interacting when the set is moving all around the boat. I think I want to ask a little bit more about what you mean by bias, because for, of course I am just one person bringing my own subjective experience to this show, and so and I can only write about it from my perspective. So how is that different from bias? Let me uh, let me let me take this opportunity to ask you to talk a little bit about what happened. Because I think that was a situation in which you had a reaction that people were saying, you know, what were your biases coming to that movie? And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what that was about. If everyone doesn't know about the um, movie you wrote last year, well, why don't I do that? Um, I, will, I will do my best. <laughs> um, I wrote a review for HowlRound last year, which is this um, website that has all kinds of art essays about theater, um, and uh, this was a show at Cal Shakes, and it was, as best as I can remember, um, an immigrant uh, from, I think from Mexico, um, he was about to take his test to become a citizen, it was the night before, he was cramming, and he felt like well, he was cramming, and he had all of these dreams that were kind of a perverse, funny, surreal version of American history. So American, American Nights. American, American Nights. Night. Yes. Um, so, so I wrote a review that both, that uh, perhaps tried to do too many things in a single article. Uh, that is one of the many criticisms leveled against my criticism. <laughs> there are many more. Um, but, um, I criticized both some aspects of the production, standard fare for, for a review, as well as the, the way that the theater, um, I, I felt that its efforts to, um, given how extremely old and white and affluent its audience is, I felt that some of its efforts to um, market this play, to make this play have broader appeal, um, might be inauthentic and short-lived. I also criticized um, some physical aspects of the layout of the theater itself. It was a very, um, for me it was a fun piece to write because I was trying to do something different with criticism. That's why I really liked writing for this website because they let me do all kinds of strange uh, things that wouldn't normally fit into a very short word count of a regular theater review. Um, but I got attacked for all different kinds of things. Um, uh, people, rightly perhaps, um, calling out my various privileges um, in being a white person and being a well-educated person um, in, in perceiving Cal Shakes' audience in a particular way, um, the list goes on. Um, so that's the background. You said uh, it's Telemundo on steroids for an audience on Man of Musel. <laughs> <laughs> I was really proud of that line. <laughs> I really like that line. Okay. But, it was, but it was very polarizing.
say, I can disclose me as much as possible about my bias and where I'm going. Well, I, I, I think what I would say is that I've been interrogating myself a lot more in the process of writing each and every article, but I don't think there's room at the beginning of every single review I write for me to write a sentence, a paragraph, uh, pages, it could be of all my various biases. That, may, that would make the review about me. And sometimes it is appropriate in a review to refer to myself. Because I, I can make it more of a personal essay. That's something that HowlRound lets me do sometimes. And I really, I really value that about, about writing there. Um, because it's a more, it can be a more rewarding kind of writing. Um, but it's, it's just not the right thing to do in every single article. Uh, you're writing a review of a show. You're not writing about yourself. And if, if you can't be honest with yourself about what your biases are, and, and you're, you're never going to be, be able to see yourself as clearly as other people see you, or, or in, in the way that other people see you, of course. Um, but if you, if you don't try to interrogate yourself, I don't think you're going to last as a critic, or I don't think you're going to be a very good critic. And if you, if you, count, if you feel that urge to disclose, I mean, there are certain things Is the little man jumping, or is he absent, or is he coming? And that's 
whether or not they feed them to you, that's the decision to make. If you're aware of that power. I don't think, I think the little man, we did a history of the little man a few years ago. <laughs> in which they, they showed the early, the little man in his early sketches and whatnot. I can't remember how old the little man is at this point, whether he started before World War II, I think it was after World War II. I think it was in the 40s. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think it was 46, 47. So yeah, you may engage more with the writing there, 
but you're still always dealing with this as an experience for people who are reading with the question of whether they might be interested in going. And it's harder to do now that reviews are shorter than they were 10 years ago because we have less space. as well as in the review. But there was a critic for the examiner in the uh, 70s and 80s, Nancy Scott, some of you may remember. And Nancy had wonderful ability to, she had her very clear likes and dislikes about bias. And she was very clear that she did not care for experimental theory. And there was, as many of you know, an explosion of wonderful or awful, but absolutely <laughs> fascinating experimental theater going on in the 70s and 80s, you know. Zoom 3 and Night Fire and Night Letter and Coach Coats and Antenna and, and uh, all of these, uh, Gulf of the Pharaoh, all these different groups. And Nancy would go to these and she would write in a way that was quite clear that she didn't care for this kind of thing, but she would describe the experience so well that you could read that review and think, wow, that's something I might really be into. Or, you know, that sounds like something I've seen you know, too often. Or, you know, you knew exactly what she was talking about. And unfortunately, as reviews get smaller, it's that freedom to write descriptively that get more and more curtailed in my opinion, in my experience. Um, but I'm not taking it too much stuff. No, no, not at all. I mean, that's, you know, I, what I'm, I'm thinking about whether or not the reading audience understands that because they're in less amount of space, that they might not be getting the guidelines somebody want to go or be curious or want to learn more. I 
remember writing a rather negative review of the show in Berkeley, and then a small theater, um, and then being in Northside in Berkeley and seeing my review was printed up as a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> with the line, um, you know, the, what was it? Um, I don't remember, but something like you know, disaster or <laughs> exciting theater. You may have made up your own mind. <laughs> and I think it worked. I think they were <laughs> Thank you. 
biases are a very big part of what, um, what I'm thinking about when I'm seeing something in my own I think that's a very good point because I, I think it's very true that you go, there's the whole question of expectations. If you go with really high expectations, you're doing that for the right of the service and that production of the service. And if you go with really low expectations, you're much more likely to be seen. You know, any time, I think poor Tony Christian, poor Tony Christian. <laughs> <laughs> every, time he, every time he's written anything, since angels in America, I think how high he set the bar for that, you know. Who could ever reach that bar? I actually think he has reached that bar with kind of with Caroline.
wow, they're doing something new and newsworthy. That sometimes it's that. Um, sometimes the the description of the show itself sounds like it's something I've never seen before, or that it won't be trite. I can just tell from from the description. Um, some sometimes it's just what mood am I in? What kind of show do I want to see? So it it depends on all different kinds of factors for me. Yeah, and it's the same with me, um, particularly if I know if, if there's some good actors in the cast, if I know the director, who you know, I've seen the work of the director or the playwright, or I just know the company and I know that they have a certain standard that they always stick to. Um, and I will say that I see way more shows than I have the opportunity to write about, way more. So when I make those choices, I've seen a lot of theaters and a lot of shows and a lot of directors, so I, I try to, since I can pretty much write about anything, any show I want to write about, if my editor wants me to, but she doesn't force me to do anything that I don't want to go to, I do tend to go to shows that I think I would really like, so I, I'm always sort of, you know, skewing it in that direction, so going in with the most um, positive, optimistic outlook. One other thing I pay attention to that I forgot to mention is that um, I also have a great deal of freedom. I don't have to see any particular show. It's totally up to me. And um, I know that for smaller companies, um, they're not going to get as many critics to come. And that having a critic come is a much bigger deal for them. ACT and Berkeley Rep, it will not make any difference to them whatsoever, whether I come or not. And really, you know, it won't make a difference what I say in my review or not. Uh, that's not true for Rob, perhaps, but it is true for me. But a show at the Phoenix Theater downtown or in any of the small black boxes, if they get a piece in the week, that can, be, that can actually change people's careers. And I am conscious of that, and so, Often if it's down to the wire, not that it's ever a perfect comparison between this show or that show and what I'm choosing to see or anything like that. But I really do take that into consideration because one of the greatest rewards of being a critic is to bring attention to new and worthy artists who people don't know about. That is such an exciting thing and it's so great when that happens and that you're a part of it. I absolutely, I absolutely agree with that, with what Roy just said. Um, they, at, at the Chronicle, obviously, it's different um, because, well, for obvious reasons, because we are a major metropolitan band of this And so there is a, a, an expectation that we will be covering all of the major this 
I pay attention to the bugs, as I probably will, and I do, and sometimes I get out to see things that I probably can't believe you, but just so that I can, can check in with that in the future. But in making the choice for those two or three that I'm going to be able to review that month, Because 
the, the buzz you get are what you're hearing. Some of it is totally unsolicited. Some of it is what people write to you, and you have to use it to that they are not connected to that theater company. And most of the people you are. <laughs> Because all the you know, I'll hear from from uh, actors or from directors or playwrights whose work I've written about, and they say, "Hey, you might really want to go check this out." And I'll hear from you know people, friends, people in my family, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, it's uh, it makes a difference. And I can't always act. Was the f- 
founder of the Market Theater in Johannesburg. The Market Theater, which was the first space, first place to produce Apple for the art. First space to present theater with integrated casts and two integrated audiences in South Africa. And when the government shut, tried to shut them down, Barney was able to say, But one of the things, because I asked him about, you know, how obviously operated the way that they did, the government was continually trying to close them down, or many for other forces in South Africa. And I said, how do you manage? You know, and he said, because theater artists are like cockroaches. <laughs> when they turn the lights on, we scatter. But as soon as the lights go, I 
Tigers, that would be saying, well, you know, I mean, the Billy Valley premiere or whatever show. But I mean, if some show has had, uh, you know, a world premiere at some storefront theater in, I don't know where, uh, some place in the country, I mean, is that something that the three of you think about when you make a decision to go see a show? Is this matter into your thinking at all, whether it's a world premiere? It does for me in terms of the public work to go to the prize. Okay. But it doesn't in terms so much in terms of what I'm going to review really because if it hasn't been seen here before, it's a good show to any of us. Okay. And even then, you know, there are certain I mean, as I said, you know, that production of Afro Bay goes as far as the Huggins and the Coyles brought to the scene. But I, I've never seen it before, and I, the chance of seeing one of her works. And what was the one that Mary Shakespeare? Uh, oh, Thomas. Oh, yeah, that one. The kid. Thomas Day last summer. Yeah, yeah no. Um, Okay. <laughs> 
you've given them some frustrated playwrights and you have some experience acting and you've seen so many plays, when you're watching a show that doesn't work that well for you, what do you do with that feeling of, of wanting to say, well, the director should have done this, or that, what the hell is that direct, that actor thinking, or the, the, the script should have done this other thing? You know, how, do you, how do you then go and write a, a criticism without saying, well, if I were doing it, I would have done it? Do you ever struggle with that? I think frustration. I think none of us are drama. Um, there was a lovely critic for the Los Angeles Times who became the drama critic and then the said that's pretty pretty rare. Um, and I think we're all aware that we're not drama critics. At least I know that I'm frequently frequently will get those kinds of questions from people in the theater. Well, what would you advise us to do you know, after we lose the written all book again? My, my response is that's not my business. I'm not, I'm not qualified. I don't feel qualified. And I know from the experience of having gone through a production, that turned out to be a play that I had reviewed three years earlier, redone, and sitting there thinking, oh no, he did exactly what I suggested. That's <laughs> 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 terrible. <laughs> so I don't, when I first started as a having been an actor, there was, I did have to repress in myself that that urge, you know, let me show you how to do that. You know, that's not the way, you know, if you read the line like this way. Uh, and I have a good friend who I will not mention uh, by name, uh, who was a director, and I thought a terrific director, who I took to the theater with me a few times and stopped because he actually literally started putting his head on the back of the seat in front of him because of what he was seeing on the stage. <laughs> so so you, have to, you have to suppress the sense of um, Bernie Weiner, who I, uh, I mentioned earlier, I remember, was actually because he did occasionally write advice to the uh, to the directors was challenged to remember this to the director. Oh, yeah. and, and he did. And he, and he went out. Terrible. <laughs> 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 so, and he was and he did and he went out 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 and he did that 
that that one single performance purely and yeah. the impossibility of doing that and trying to find a way anyway. You have to guard against reviewing the play that you wish to see uh, rather than the play that you actually saw. So you point out a failing or something that's not working, but right. you're not going to make any suggestions. <laughs> Not really. I mean, some, sometimes, sometimes they're just going to do it. And, you know, I think any of us who have acted have had that humbling experience of seeing somebody, you know, you've seen people perform roles that you've performed and you just sat there and sh shook your head. But then you see somebody perform that role where you go, uh -huh. I totally missed it. Yeah. Oh, Alex is in his memoir. <laughs> Alec Guinness said that every time he was in a show, if it was a movie, and as soon as they had filmed maybe three quarters, a, a, a third or a half of the film, or if he was in a play, the, you know, the, the day after the final dress rehearsal, he would be on a bus in London, and he'd be sitting at the top of the bus and looking out, and he'd see somebody on the street go, oh, that's what I should have done. <laughs> That's the key to this character. Well, you know, this conversation is so great. I don't want to stop it, but I promised Rob that I wouldn't go too far down to the night club. So I want to see if there is, a, do we have any other people in the audience? Oh, now they're going to come out with the cockroach corners. Thank you. Well, I thought uh, this. Um, almost going off sort of, of what you just said, Lily, about how you can only review the play that's on stage in front of you, um, and also notwithstanding what you said about every you know review being different, every play needs a different kind of review. Um, I've noticed though, you know, some reviews tend to be, I guess you'd say, fairly narrow in their scope, like this is the play, this is what I thought, these actors, others try to be a lot more broad, maybe you know, drawing connections between the play and larger thing in society, other plays that have treated the same issue. Um, for a new work, how do you decide whether to review the play just in that isolation, this is the production I saw, and when you try to make it into a larger, you know, draw out larger connections? I know this, this might be a, a kind of frustrating answer because it's, it's going to be vague, but it goes back to something Rob said earlier, which is, you write about what you take away with you. And that is going to be different each night. Um, sometimes you don't take away a whole lot. And then you might write a, a more, a drier piece, um, a less ambitious piece. Not every piece of criticism you write is going to be this glorious work of art. Um, but it, it, has, it has to vary. Um, and the process of decision making is so different for, for each show. Um, for me, when um, when I'm writing my reviews at SF Weekly, I often they don't even let me write about just one show um, in my 800 words. They usually want me to write about two, and I see the logic behind that because they cover more shows, you know. And I want to be able to do that too. But if I'm writing 350 to 400 words, if I get a plot summary one descriptive detail and an argument in there, I am the champion. I mean, that's that's really all I can do. And those are pretty much the only pieces I'm writing now. Um, all that, all those HowlRound reviews I was talking about before, uh, I, I'm, I'm very sad that I'm, I'm not writing them anymore, but I decided that their wage was too low not worth my time, so it's, it's tough. My reviews are only 400 words, so like Lily, whatever grabs me most about that particular production on that particular night is really all I have space to write about. small theater company and we do all new plays. We're always trying to get uh, reviews, obviously, because it does help. So I just want to say thank you for talking about what you do. It's really enlightening to hear about it. And I'm curious, with so few reviewers and so many plays, do you 
how you feel about a lot of the blogs and sort of the local uh, individuals and folks who have started reviewing how that adds or detracts from the critical conversation. I think more voices, more is always better. Um, I like having more voices out there. I learned so much from the bloggers. They, they give me so many things to think about, so many perspectives, and they often cover things that I wouldn't cover or don't get to cover. Um, I, I just wish we could have both. I wish we could have professional salary theater critics um, who've got enough space and who had the time to you know, do the research to write the kind of articles theaters want to have written about them. But that takes um, somebody's time and money. I wish we could have that and this wonderful blogosphere that we have. Um, it does, I, I guess this is a little prideful and selfish of me, but it does, maybe it does make me a little sad when I see uh, theaters taking uh, quotes from a really, really badly written blog. Like that, that just, that kind of, that hurts me a little bit because I wish, I, I wish it could be better. I wish that weren't the only thing out there. Yeah. Sometimes that's the only thing we have. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree with you. If it's not a if it's not a serious conversation, I don't think it's very helpful for the piece. And I actually don't understand. You know, over the years I've probably probably have seen at least eight attempts to start
is like getting them to use a gas and blood program. It gives people a chance and a bunch of different purposes. And I think that's, that seems to be a response to that idea that you should have one place, one critic that keeps a new play in. But I think it's also a response to, well, to the idea that, as, as you expressed, why, you know, theaters get grants to put on the world premiere, and nobody gets a grant to put on the second production, right, or the third production. And this was a way to make sure that each of these plays would get a minimum of three productions. And also,
press at the time um, talking about this and saying, how, you know, this was just the most incredible deal you can know, do you can do something like this. And then I went and covered it.